Welcome back to uh, the Nutramedical Report, and it's great to have uh, back on the program Joel Skousen, probably one of the best in the analysts that looks deeper uh, into the dialectics of what's really going on in your world. Uh, his newsletter is probably the prescient newsletter for analyzing what's really happening, like your analysis last week, Joel, of the situation in Gaza where the dialectics are being managed by the globalists. That's why they don't want a real solution to any of these problems. And that's why, for example, the rocket parts continue to arrive in Gaza, and they're probably restocking during this period of so-called truce. Uh, the situation with Russia and China is another good example where I think you're the only one I know that writes a regular report that's, that fits in exactly with my personal experience uh, working, taking care of, and having friends like uh, Colonel Lynn Wells from U.S. Space Command and Strategic Defense that managed the unlocking keys to uh, our space base, to our space-based weapon systems and our submarine and, and land-based nuclear weapons of the Joint Chiefs and the President called. Um, you're the only one that says that uh, Russia and China are planning a nuclear attack or first strike on America, and our PDD-60 policy basically says we don't have an automatic counterattack. So, uh, you know, your newsletter is essential reading, and people better also get your books to, you know, strategic relocation, the video now, and the material that uh, you put out uh, recently in video over, uh, I think it's available now on uh, Alex Jones' website, uh, the videos and other materials you put together. Uh, people better be aware that these are remote events, but they're not unlikely. Well, you know, it's been um, the Obama re-election has just sent shockwaves through the nation. Gun sales are just heavy. Ammunition sales are heavy. People really uh, have realized, you know, we've got the majority now voting against us, even though I think there was significant vote fraud uh, involved in this election. Nevertheless, people really worry that the jig is up. And I've always said, while we fight to prepare uh, to defend our liberty, we've got to prepare for the takedown. We've got to prepare to lose. The worst thing you want to do is suddenly have the government at your door ready to lock you up and you haven't prepared to run you haven't prepared a safe place you haven't prepared a haven it's just incredible ever since Alex Jones uh, did this two hour documentary with me uh, called Strategic Relocation I mean literally Strategic Relocation has been selling in the thousands a week it's just incredible how many yeah, people, people, people must know, know intuitively now. Yeah, they must know intuitively that what you're saying is now finally reaching the, the critical point where they're now willing to accept the truth that with the re-election of Obama they know that the globalists have seized control of our federal government yeah and it's going to be very bad for us the next four years and uh, you know with somebody like uh, John Boehner heading the Republicans who, who works for the same people that Obama does I mean it's just a matter of yeah. political theater playing like he's defending and giving in and compromising and Oh yeah, it's, they can get. It's really it, sickening. It is. I mean, how many issues he doesn't deal with Benghazi? He never dealt with the uh, illegal uh, uh, declaration of war against Libya and Syria. Uh, even the, after the revelations that uh, the Obama administration were directly arming Al Qaeda, which is again a violation of the acts of war, he should have been impeached. But yet none of these things came up, and Boehner just lets it get a pass. And now, of course, with the fiscal cliff coming. They're planning on compromising, so we're going to get the worst of both worlds. We'll get both uh, increased entitlements, no balanced budget, and we'll have compromises that will raise taxes and crush small business. So I see the worst of all possibilities happening because Boehner is not going to do his job. But it's important to realize that, you know, there's been <clears throat> way, way too much hype throughout this entire year about imminent collapse. Yeah, that's not going to happen either. I agree. Yeah, it tells about it because... My, my newsletter and others is that... You know, a lot of people, especially the free market group, even Peter Schiff, who I respect immensely, and Doug Casey and other people, you know, just keep talking about him and collapse because in Austrian economics, the thing has to collapse. But they fail to understand the powers that still remain in the hands of the powers to be, and they right. can hold this off a lot longer. You know, they keep talking about hyperinflation on the corner. That can't happen without the two essential, essential ingredients. You've got to have a relatively small money supply where it's easy to double and triple it. And secondly, you have to have an automatic injection. And we don't have a small money. We've got the largest money supply in the world, 10 times larger than the euros, perhaps 15 times. Nobody knows for sure because there's so many dollars that have been printed over the decades that people have stuffed in their <clears throat> mattresses and, and used yeah. their own personal reserve. But, you know, I've estimated there's two to $300 trillion out there, and that's not counting the non-monetized 
uh, dollars in derivatives and hedge fund contracts. Yeah, the electronic dollars. The number I've heard the from a couple of different experts is around 87% of all the currency on Earth is either in physical dollars or denominated electronic dollars is 87% of all the world currency is in U.S. dollars. So inflating even trillions of dollars, a few trillion dollars, is like a drop in the bucket. It's like a, it's like it's a like drop in the ocean. You know, it's a, it's no <clears throat> surprise to me that our inflation rate, the real inflation rate, is 7 to 9%. And they can keep that going a long time because people can and are adapting. They've been adapting to 7 to 9% for decades now. So don't tell me that people can't adapt to that level of inflation. Now, it's not, right. it, we're still going downhill slowly. But if you started to get up to 10 or 15 or 20 percent inflation, now that's not hyperinflation, but that still would create stagflation. Because without that second element that I talked about necessary for hyperinflation, you could have an automatic injection mechanism whereby government puts money into the pockets of everybody so they can adjust to inflation. That's what happened in Weimar. People don't understand. How do you start doubling and tripling and quadrupling the money supply within a year? unless you're allowing, giving money more to people so they can keep up with those prices. And that's exactly yeah. what the German government was doing. They took over the payment of all wages of German workers after the French came in and, and uh, started confiscating the output and stopped paying the German workers in the German industrial district. And that's why hyperinflation occurred. Now, the other secondary reason, of course, that the U.S. advisors... The, you know, J.P. Morgan and those people, uh, the globalists in those days, Carnegie and others, advised the Weimar Republic to start to water down the currency. Is one that's the easiest way to get rid of your debt to the World War One is to water down the currency. But secretly, I believe this was Hegelian dialectic again, trying to create hatred of the German people against the free market, and it opened the doors wide open for both communism and Nazism, Nazi socialism. So socialism and communism were created by the, by the destruction of what appeared to be the free market economy, which really was a manipulated fiat money economy, hardly the free market. Right. They did those things, and that's why communists came to power and Nazism came to power. Yeah, right now, for example, we don't really have true, uh, you, know, you want to call it the original idea of capitalism in America. We have a form of corporatism. And, of course, with yeah. Obama, they're moving to a form of very aggressive corporatism. It's starting to look more and more like communist China, where you have 80 million communists and the rest are indentured slaves. Uh, Obama's plan to court help the middle classes to help them into poverty uh, and, and dependency. So the number of people that are going to be getting entitlements in these next four years will probably balloon dramatically. But Obama will just print more money. And if he has to spray down the overheated printing presses with Bernanke, he'll do it. That's right, but they'll keep it moderated in terms of inflation. <clears throat> Remember, they've got sure they will. seven to nine, per, seven to nine percent inflation. That <clears throat> doesn't even count the, the the electronic inflation that's going on that goes on to the bailouts in Europe, the undercover bailouts to the big banks that are still ongoing. You know, look at QE three. This is ongoing. You know, twenty billion dollars a month to the big banks, and none of that's getting back into the economy. They are buying out the worst. Of the uh, of the mortgage, the mortgages that aren't worth anything that should be written off that are already foreclosed, the government buying that out and making the banks whole, and the banks are putting that right back into the speculative economy where they earn their three percent, save their bottom line, and nobody's increasing l uh, lending. Yeah, yeah, I've heard it also is driving up commodities like food prices and other commodities that is sliding into the speculative uh, commodity markets too. Is that true? Yes, it is true, and that's part of the reason why oil stays as high as it is. It's uh, subject to a lot of speculation. The speculation, you know, why should they invest in the real economy when all the big banks and investment houses can make 8 to 15 percent speculating in the forex market, in the commodities markets, in the oil markets, and everything? That really isn't helping the real economy. Yeah. Now, you can't, and I'm not saying we ought to shut it down and make it illegal for people to invest or speculate. But what I am saying is that it should be illegal not to allow margin. In other words, keep, keep that thought. We'll be right back. And we're back with uh, Joel Skelton. Joel, you had a very important point you were mentioning just before we went to break. Uh, 
that we need to repeat because I think people need to grasp some of the principle you're teaching in your newsletter, which shows up repeatedly throughout the newsletter. The underlying themes are very unique, and I believe they're smack on. A lot of people don't understand that there's a lot of pundits say, oh, there's an imminent collapse. There is not an imminent collapse. The dollar is a gradual slide, but there's so many levers of control that the globalists have in America. It's the primary vehicle, if you want to call it, for worldwide debt and for hegemony. And I do believe that America is being set up for a great fall. I mean, the transfer of technology, I remember taking care of uh, uh, engineers and technicians working at all these companies in Colorado, and they'd open the doors up to, uh, f to foreign uh, transfer to communist Chinese or Russians. It's like craziness. It's like, why would you arm your enemies? Well... Uh, you know, the globalists, it's like uh, the statement of Vladimir Lenin, I shall be busy about uh, preparing and organizing my opposition. It's very dangerous, very crazy, very satanic, but it really is happening. Well, the point I was making before, you mm. know, a lot of conservatives ignorantly getting, have false solutions for the problems that they have. And, you know, the problem isn't to ban all regulation. There's proper regulation, there's improper regulation. But I am totally against legalizing and making it legal for people to engage in Ponzi schemes. And really, anytime you issue derivatives, it's a Ponzi scheme because you're saying, look, I've got, I don't have any backing guys. I'm going to issue a promise to pay for this CDS insurance policy, a derivative. I'm going to promise that if the euro collapses, I'm going to pay $500 billion. Well, you don't have $500 billion. Billion. That's fraud to write right. a contract to say a promise to pay when you don't have the money. Insurance companies can't do that. They've got to have a portion of it, at least, by law, in cash or cash-like assets. And I think that we could actually stop a great deal of this speculation without You can't say it's illegal to speculate because that's part of the free market. Is, is right. But what you do is say, you have to put up all your money to speculate. I mean, you can't speculate and say, I'm going to put in $10 on 100 No, put up $100, and that would slow it down. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I think that proper rulings like Glass Steagall and these rules over uh, speculative banking, it also means that when they buy these mortgage backed securities, rather than a simple solution like letting the value of properties drop to the real value and allowing people to still maintain their equity. So let's say a house drops from 700 to 400,000 and they have 200, 100,000 in equity. Uh, that solution was never sought. What they did is they're now selling mortgage-backed securities to maintain the high prices of homes. So a lot of them That's are still right. upside down. It's 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 not a solution to the problem. And the, and the globalists are basically saying to people like Obama, and he's just a, another puppeteer. You know, I we call him a, I call him Barack and uh, Barack and Okio. He basically is a puppet of Soros and the banksters. Uh, and on, on the other side, the Republicans, we see uh, the same thing with Bonner and a lot of the Republicans. They're they're no better. They're just operating their side of the dialectic. Yeah, there are team A and team B. They work the Republican side and the Democratic side. And that's why we would not have seen hardly any change at all, even if Mitt Romney had been in there. Because, first of all, you can't solve the fiscal cliff problem. You can't solve the deficit spending problem because there isn't enough political capital in all the world to cut off these benefits to people. Everybody just howls like murder if you start cutting off any of this age-dependent children or any of these other welfare schemes that really need to be to be cut off. Romney didn't have the, won't have, wouldn't have the power to do that, especially with the Democratic control of the Senate. And worse yet, with his history of compromise, he would have tried to convince <coughs> conservatives that the compromises he would make with the Democrats uh, are, are beneficial, and that's how we move continually closer to full socialism in the United States. Well, now, well, in 2013, we're going to have the... We're going to have the fiscal cliff happen. Tell us how this fits in with this, because I think this is a fully manufactured way to make us stomach things that are bad from both sides. How will this kind of fit in? Well, in the first place, uh, I just don't think the fiscal cliff is ever going to happen. Uh, there are draconian cuts, across-the-board cuts, and there's just no political capital for it. People get unelected if they let that go through. So you'll have people either figure out some compromise where they don't have to actually make cuts. Um, and just like the tax increase, I mean, uh, it, it's going to be a disaster for the economy, a disaster for family farms if the state tax comes back into play. And that's, you know, the Bush tax cuts should be made permanent. Not, uh, stop this fall to all about putting it off a decision for another two years where you can let the, the Democrats twist your arms about things. And they've got the control because you can't pass 
anything without that Democratic Senate uh, to give approval, and you've got a Democratic president who can veto it. So we don't have two-thirds to pass anything. So this is stalemate still. But nevertheless, the only way that I see that anyone's going to agree is just to say, well, we're not going to let the physical cliff happen. We're not going to sequester the budget as we promised that we would do. I think it needs to. It would at least do something to stop spending if you sequestered it. But, you know, you have the debt ceiling coming up. Bernanke's calling for an unlimited debt ceiling now. Stop this voting on the debt ceiling. In reality, I am in favor, and that's the one thing Republicans could do. If they're serious about fiscal responsibility, they can stop the government in its tracks just by saying, we are not voting for any more debt. So you now have to live in your, within your means. You don't need a balanced budget amendment. All you have to do is stop voting for the debt ceiling increase. Yeah, exactly. That's why. I, that's why. Go ahead. And that's why Bernanke wants this vote to be done away with and just say, no, we have to allow for an unlimited debt ceiling, so stop voting on it, because he knows that's the one balanced budget law that's on the books that can stop and force a balanced budget immediately and stop uh, you know, voting for the increase of the debt ceiling. Wow. Now, what's, likely, what's, what's likely to happen between now and Christmas and uh, the New Year? Uh, obviously, they're doing this dance at the same time. They're, in a sense, worried that they're going to scare the shoppers, although the shopping went up 11.8% in terms of money over Thanksgiving weekend. Um, what's likely to happen in the next uh, four weeks? Well, nothing really. What I think is going to happen is that <clears throat> they're going to come to a compromise on the Bush tax cuts. Nobody wants to see those enacted again, and the Democrats know that it'd be deadly to them. So they're going to pass the Bush tax cuts again, except for some tax increases for the wealthy. I think that's what you're going to see. The, the fiscal cliff, the sequestering of the budget, automatic cuts don't start until January 13th, and it's only going to be a portion of it. It isn't the whole budget. It's spread out over several years. And so the first set of sequestering automatic uh, cuts come to pass on January 13th, and I think that they will, the Republicans will compromise so that that doesn't have to happen, because they're going to get the blame if it does. Yeah, that totally makes sense. In other words, they'll be able to blame the Republicans for, for causing the problem. Yeah, I mean, even though, you know, and of course the Republicans are partially responsible for the deficit spending, which you know, push the deficit higher than anyone. Reagan had a lot of deficit spending. Uh, and so, you know, Clinton well, gets away with saying that, you know, I had a surplus. Well, I just happened to have a very period of high inflation during, uh, during Clinton's role, and money was rolling in. It wasn't because they were doing anything different or being any more prudent. Uh, well, I think the, rolling in. The, the can opener was 9-11, and, of course, the illegal wars were the things that drove the budget up even way over the limit by trillions of dollars. Uh, I'd even suggest that uh, the illegal wars and the massive budgets were part of the game to create this giant debt monster as part of the dialectic. Well, you know, the wars have a, have a separate purpose. In fact, I... Uh, Back in a moment. I think... Welcome back. Uh, Joe, you had an important comment just before the break. I'd like you to continue that, please. Well, you know, the trouble with talking with you during the break is that we long lose those trains of thoughts, Bill. You'll have to refresh my memory. Uh, uh, well, what we're, we were talking about is we're talking about the whole issue of uh, Russia and China. And, of course, uh, the conflict in the Middle East is keeping up uh, the price of oil. It, it shot up uh, temporarily due to the eight days of the rocket attacks against Israel to, I think, around $111 a barrel. And it's kind of modulating. But the Russians are walking, uh, waltzing to the bank, making lots of money. Even after Gulf War II, uh, the China Oil Company now is the fifth largest oil refining company on Earth. They've basically been promised the oil. So our blood and treasure went to make sure that the resources from Iraq went to China. Uh, this is obviously a globalist move. It doesn't make any financial sense for America. I remember the promises years ago of don't worry about the cost of the war, Senator, several senators were saying. Uh, that the oil that comes out of Iraq will pay for the price of the war, and it never did. Yeah, yeah, I'm supposed to pay for the reconstruction as well. Yeah, and it never did. It's a, what's happening is that money is, in a sense, going to China, who's now refining the oil, buying it at, 
at very reduced prices, and it goes directly to this giant empire of China now. Even with the Kirk Amendment uh, for Russia and China, even if there was a blockade against the Strait of Hormuz, uh, we've guaranteed that they'll still be able to get their oil from Iraq, the Chinese and Russians, and gas. Yeah, and that's why we, you know, we have guarantees to North Korea there'll be no regime change. Here's the most radical, tyrannical regime in the world. And we promised them no regime change, no military intervention. There's no other nation on the face of the earth that has the promise that the military option is off the table, except North Korea, the worst that there is. Go figure. You know, this is clearly building enemies for the future. I have long said that North Korea is going to be the trick, is being preserved specifically to be the trigger for World War III. It will not yeah. be Iran and Israel. That will stay regional. And it will yeah. be a very bad war when it starts, but it will stay regional. Now, do you think that it will be a North Korean attack on South Korea? Because what I've heard from my sources is that Taiwan, South Korea, and Japan are armed to the teeth. In fact, the Fukushima Daiichi plant that was affected by the Sendai earthquake and tsunami was actually a weapons development facility with a plutonium detonator enrichment facility, and which is part of the reason why we're not getting full disclosure is that the Japanese, with their very advanced rockets for delivering satellites, also could very quickly and literally almost, in quote, a weekend, become a nuclear power, uh, which they are overtly. You know, behind the scenes, I think we have uh, China surrounded by nuclear powers and that it would very quickly bring America into a nuclear conflict uh, with our allies there, South Korea, Japan, and Taiwan. Well, you don't... Uh, Japan, in fact, is not developing nuclear weapons. Uh, if they have them, it's because the U.S. has transferred them to it. But I frankly doubt that that's happened, that the U.S. stays controlled it. Japan's going to get taken down by China in the early days of this war. There's a grudge match there that the Chinese have never forgotten about. A lot of hatred, isn't there? In fact, I think it happened about a month or so ago. There's been a, a major dispute over some northern islands. But uh, I have from my sources that not only has America deployed nuclear weapons in Japan for five decades, they've also, uh, the Japanese have been working on developing their own stockpile of nuclear weapons as well. So uh, I know that there's... Oh, I don't have take... confirmation of that. Yeah, I have from and some of my sources that... There's a severe there's, there's... anti-nuclear climate in Japan. Uh, it would have to stay secret and... You couldn't uh, do that extensively, uh, but, uh, you know, without, uh, you know, U.S. covering for it or keeping most of it under their control. But nevertheless, you don't need anything yeah. but North Korea versus the South. Now, even though the yeah. South has increased weapons from the United States, it's nowhere near enough to counter the hundreds of thousands of troops uh, across the border. The 200,000 artillery troops, I mean, literally they can blanket Seoul with artillery shells in in, a, in the first 10 minutes. Exactly. And, you know, in fact, the they have the largest amount of tubeless rocket systems on the Earth, haven't they? And so the only way to stop that is in, because the U.S. has troops there, some either seven to 13,000, depending on the deployment. You know, they're basically being held as bait there to draw the United States in. And I think the only way that the U.S. could stop a, South, a North Korean invasion is to use tactical nuclear weapons. Now, notice that this is important. Because by purposely allowing yourself to be so vulnerable that you have to respond with tactical nuclear, it gives China an excuse to, to say the U.S. started it, the first use of nukes, and we're going to launch. And, uh, now, they, do the, do the Chinese have weapons? Strike. Yeah, so the Chinese want to strike. Do they have weapons uh, positioned closer? For example, uh, do you have any information about them having positioned weapons in either Mexico or South America with their allies of China? Because the Chinese are... They do not, they do not have missiles in either of those countries. And so you think they're, they're, amount of about China in, in Mexico, and uh, it's only trade so far. There's no military, no troops of Chinese troops in Mexico. All of that is... You know, there's a whole bevy of disinformation experts that keep feeding and flooding the, the web with false conspiracies to get us all discredited, and that's one of them. So would these would be land-based uh, launches because they, they don't have a large blue army of navy, so uh, would it be a, a land-based uh, launch from China? No. no. Or, they can get or, to the United States from the mainland. They don't need to have land-based in Mexico to launch out and get to the United States. Yeah, in other words, mainland China to America launches that way, yeah. That's right. They can launch that way. They've also got submarines that have been able to infiltrate our own Navy exercises. They've launched 
I mean, the Chinese launched a submarine already right off the coast of Los Angeles. Launched their yeah, yeah, it was up in Point Magoo there, just north of Los Angeles. Uh, right, there. That, that was last year. Exercise. Chinese, they were having, the U.S. Navy was having an exercise. The Chinese slipped in and launched a missile. I mean, just, can you imagine that? Here's a major naval exercise. The Pentagon's modern, all of a sudden, a Chinese slip into the middle of it, launch a missile, and everybody goes apoplectic. They have to deny that it's a missile because, I mean, the Chinese are just laughing at them. Here you're having a missile exercise where you have submarines chasing other submarines, detecting, and we come right in with our lower technology stuff and launch a missile right in the middle of your exercise. Talk I don't know how that's possible, though, with a technology that we have for space-based imaging using uh, torsion field imaging and uh, our advanced sonar and so on. It, it to me, is boggles my mind that, uh, that that could happen, that they would be totally ignorant of the fact that these... You know, Russia. I heard there was also a situation recently this summer of a Russian sub that showed up right in the middle of the Gulf of Mexico. Yeah, but that's not atypical. Uh, I mean, Russians have been flying the East Coast and the Caribbean uh, uh, for a long time, and they have to keep practicing to see. And they like to see if we get detected because it tells them more. And if they don't, if they don't get detected, what it tells them is maybe the U.S. detected us, and they aren't saying. But when there isn't a detection announced, at least they know what they did wrong. So there, it's a cat and mouse game that they're playing. But remember that uh, China doesn't have to rely strictly on land base because they are building a blue water neighbor. They are building submarines like crazy and boasting missile submarines. So this is not for defensive purposes. They clearly intend to strike someday. I still think it's at least eight to ten years away before Russia and China have rebuilt their navy sufficiently to prosecute this war. Yeah, absolutely. That's why they, they haven't uh, grabbed the cheese. What about the uh, uh, the the financial situation in China? Because they're generating 10 new jobs uh, for every uh, 10 new individuals for every job that's, that's growing in China uh, and their economy is sort of superheated based on, on manufacturing and selling to the West whether it's Europe or the United States, Canada and other Western nations. Um, what's likely to happen in the next few years because I would think that uh, that would be a very unstable situation for the current leadership there if they uh, have a major downturn because they, they're they growing at 78% per year, but it's a kind of a, a paper tiger. I mean, if there ever is a major downturn, even a moderate downturn in terms of buying Chinese goods or there's more protectionism, they're going to have an internal uh, disaster. Well... Once again, I think you underestimate the power of the Communist Party to tamp down on social unrest. Uh, there's been very few, very little social unrest in China. I mean, people, we've got to remember there's centuries of being in abject poverty. And, you know, there's these petty warlords over them, and they're ruthless uh, in their local provinces. I think. They have no weapons. I mean... Uh, I, I'm just not optimistic. Yeah, in other, yeah, in other words, it's very unlikely that they're going to have a history or, or culture that they will be able to resist the, uh, the reduction in, in, in violence by the public against a, uh, a regime. Yeah, that makes sense. Back in a moment with the analysis, Joel Skousen. Welcome back, and uh, Joel, uh, we want to make sure people know how to get the uh, free uh, sample newsletter, which is to go to, uh, to email at editor at worldaffairsbrief.com, and of course your website, uh, Joel Skousen, S-K-O-U-S-E-N.com, gives information about the two-hour video on uh, strategic relocation, the strategic relocation uh, latest edition, and of course the uh, Secure Home uh, book as well. These are absolutely called essential reading. If you want to know what area of the country you're in, which, whether there is a real physical danger from things like New Madrid, earthquakes, fault lines, uh, all kinds of different issues that can happen. Uh, and the secure home, the idea that that disaster is remote, but it's not impossible. In fact, it's quite possible. Um, but I agree. I think that uh, your analysis is a much more measured balance analysis that we're not going to have Christmas and then the fiscal cliff and a big disaster. I see the gradual evolution with the dark hand of the globalists controlling both Team A and Team B, moving us toward a global control system. And, and the only and the most powerful tool that can change everything, including move to a biometric currency, is world war. 
and uh, a, a nuclear attack on America. Without a, without a strong moral America, uh, you know, out of the way, you can't have a new world order. You have to crush America in order to create a new world currency and a new world financial order. Yes, and, you know, people, it's one thing to talk about these things. It's quite another thing to prepare. But I want to just uh, tell people, after 40 years of helping people prepare, there's an urgency now that is I had never seen in the entire 40 years I've been in you know, this business of helping people and designing high security residence and retreats. I mean, an incredible urgency. And part of it is that a lot of people who I talk to in my consultation when I say, you know, what's behind your preparedness day, even a collapse. They're all listening to Alex Jones, Gerald Salente, and Doug Quayle, and other, or Doug Hageman, or Stephen Quayle, talking about imminent collapse, and they believe them. And I say, well, first of all, it isn't imminent. The, these people underestimate the powers that be and the ability they have to keep this thing going. But it is going to come eventually, and it's going to be worse than imminent collapse of the dollar. It's going to be much worse. It's going to be imminent social collapse when a nuclear preemptive strike comes on America. And it isn't the end of the world. It's not going to hit a lot of cities. There are going to be maybe a dozen because of the military targets are just deeply within the city and you can't avoid attacking. But, you know, even if your city isn't hit, once nuclear weapon strikes happen, and peace strike happens where you lose all power and the whole grid goes down, you saw what happened in Sandy. That Hurricane Sandy with the people in New York literally, you know, fighting the gas lines and clearing out the stores and nobody could survive without well without electricity. People running around saying we're gonna to freeze to death and it was hardly even freezing weather. Uh, I mean if people were falling apart at Sandy, think what's gonna happen in a nuclear war when there is no FEMA to come and help you. Yeah, exactly. There is no federal room to keep the thing. They can't even get people to come to work because they're busy saving their own families. I mean, yeah, and that includes the EMTs, doctors, chaos. police, uh, uh, exactly, social chaos. So, in fact, I think one of the things, the rules that I was taught when I was one of the doctors for uh, taking care of uh, Delta Force, uh, Special Forces, and the people at the Federal Center in Denver, is they told me within four days to 11 days that either gangs or civilian militia would control, not the military, the cities and towns. It would break down to what are called city-states, and that within uh, two weeks, people would literally become cannibalistic. It would get that bad. So, uh, you know, it may shock people to think that that could happen, but uh, people are not prepared. They don't even have, when they're in an area where they could have a major hurricane, three w days of water, let alone weeks or months of they food. Knew in a month, they knew uh, weeks in advance this was coming. Of course, when people went to Home Depot to get generators, they were already gone. And, uh, you know, there was a run on generators. And the only people who got delivery are the ones that ordered online. So remember that little trick. If you order online rather than going down to Home Depot, you can get one secured in your name, pay for it. And when it arrives at the store, it's got your name on it already. So, uh, that, that, that's you know, clever. That's too, clever. Too many people are, are going to try to prepare. They're going to pull out their copy of strategic relocation when the bombs are falling and say, where should I go relocate? It's too late. You know, that's yeah. why the book is written. And this is just about hurricanes and other things. It does include war and government threats. And these are things that take a lot of care to think out. Yeah. Because you can't just go... You, you would believe yeah, how many yeah. people call at, and ask me, where's a good, safe place to go? And I said, you know, you know nothing about the nature of that question if you just ask me that. Because it's all customized. One person's safe place is a death knell to somebody else. I mean, not everybody can go out in, in the safest places where there are no people. Right. And there's it's no, not realistic. There's yeah. no, ag no agriculture. Yeah, and uh, you see, that's the safest because the problem is people. That's where the threats are. But who yeah, can live there? It's like Y2K. So many people went out in the boondock and quit the job. And after Y2K passed, they had to go back to the city and regroup because they couldn't make a living. It's self-sufficient. So yeah. it's pretty expensive. So yeah. be grateful for my analysis that we have more time. Take the time to prepare, not to delay. That's yeah, in other words, step by step. By step. Uh, we go through that with John Moore, who's uh, also a preparedness consultant. By the way, they can consult you because you've been on some big jobs recently in the last year, which is why we're, you weren't on regularly. 
uh, one of the first rules I tell people is if, you're, if your job is in a big city, at least move to the outskirts of the city so you're not caught in the center of the mess. Uh, prepare to have a community. You can't just have a place for yourself. It has to be with a group of people that prepare a, if you want to call it a bug out place. I see people sometimes figuring they can just leave with their husband, wife, and kids and they're going to be safe somewhere. Uh, you need a community with a whole set of skills. And you do a lot of these things in a safe home in your other book. Uh, principles about this as to where to go uh, and uh, principles of when to go there, uh, which is important. People realize that this is a multi-level response. If, for example, last year we had a power outage for, I think it was uh, 10 hours here in Southern California. Well, within three to four hours, people were fighting in the aisles of the grocery stores for ice, fist fights, and they had to have call police in, armed police in order to stop the fist fights for ice because people's food was going to rot. Uh, I don't think people realize just how people can mutate in literally hours, let alone a day or two, uh, and lose it when things break down. Yeah, and that's what makes it difficult is because, you know, self-defense, I don't mind, you know, going after criminals if they come at me. But, you know, people who are just panicky aren't necessarily evil, but, you know, join the pillaging because they're just afraid. That's a real problem, and that's why I say... You know, you can't combat that even with a handgun, nor should you. You know, that's why in my books I talk about concealment and developing basement-level uh, concealed storage rooms and safe rooms that you can get out of the way so that you don't have to confront mobs of people. You wait till that dies down, and you get away from that area where they can't find you, and then you avoid uh, that confrontation. And, you know, a lot of the, the value of strategic relocation is teaching people how to plan for contingencies, how to get out of a major metro area if you're in the L.A. or San Diego area like you are, Bill, you know. Not realizing yeah. those freeways that go around there are like moats that trap you in. You can't yeah. get past the freeways except where, in most cases, where there's an overpass and underpass. But if it's also an on-ramp or an off-ramp, those are going to be clogged. Exactly. In fact, I, I don't live in the city. I live in the in the mountainous areas in North County, San Diego, uh, which is pretty, pretty isolated, actually. So uh, <laughs> we're in a, a gated community in the mountains area here, and it's extremely defensible. I mean, it's not the ideal bug out location, but it, in terms of living on the edge of a larger community, and one of the interesting geological things is that you can think of these little niches here and there all over the country that are kind of, if you analyze all the details, they can be up to a certain level relatively safe obviously uh, but at some point things may get crazy enough that you you can't stay in your home you have to be prepared for that but that could be quite a ways to, away yeah but when you have so many people emptying out of cities that become untenable and they start spreading out they take in all the rural areas every home gets hit eventually uh, yeah and so that's why i'm saying that you have to have a leapfrog approach where you know you have something that handles short-term or even medium-term things, but when those big meltdowns come, you've got to have a bug-out plan to get to safer areas across those hundreds of miles of desert. And that's why, you know, the safest general area in the United States is the Inner Mountain West, uh, centered around Utah, where you have deserts in Nevada and Arizona and western Colorado, Montana, Wyoming, Idaho. All of those are separated from by hundreds of miles of desert from all the population centers in Seattle and San Francisco and L.A. Exactly. They can't, they can't walk there, and that's why there's great safety. There. So even people, you know, like yourself that have moved to the periphery where you've got time, you've got some distance away from it, you know, still there has to be a backup plan after that. If that wind yeah, another level. Comes up, oh, another yeah. level. Yeah. Has to be another level of plan, and we have time for that. In other words, it's not going to happen in 2013. Uh, and uh, they're not prepared in the plan yet to execute it. So time to read your books and time to get them for uh, yourself and your relatives for Christmas. Again, Joel Skousen, S-K-O-U-S-E-N.com. Get your request in the editor at worldaffairsbrief.com. Amazing update. Thank you, Joel. We'll have to have you back on regularly to update on what's going really on in our world. 